Let's get our hands together. Here we go. Do you see what I see? Do you see what I see? I see lightning, I hear thunder. Something stirring sees feet under. Again. I believe there's about to be another resurrection I see signs and I see wonder I see birds of living color Damping coming back to life again I believe there's about to be another resurrection Come alive Wake up sleeper He is risen We are risen with Him Hey, good morning, guys. Oh, my goodness. Are y'all still asleep? Yes. We just had a powerful song, and it was upbeat, and it was fast, and y'all should be like, give me something on that. Good morning, guys. Good morning. 
Hey, we are happy for you to be back today. We've got a lot of fun stuff planned today. We've got a morning session. We've got more small groups. Then we're going to do games down at Camp Tuscoba. We are so excited for you to be here today. And man, wasn't that song awesome? Did y'all know that he's not in the grave, that he's risen, and he's calling people to wake up from their sleep? And did y'all know this too? We had some people who came out from sleep last night and were called into a relationship with him and made that decision for the very first time. Is that not awesome? Hey, we've got a a full day. I'm not going to take up much time at all this morning. Just want to welcome you here. I hope you have a great day. I'm going to call on Miss Ashley to come forward. She's from New Hope Baptist. She's going to lead us in prayer. And we're going to turn it back over to Ryan and the guys. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for letting all of us be here this morning. Lord, I can't think of a better way to spend a Saturday morning but in your house. Lord, thank you for the salvations that were made last night, Lord. Be with each person today that you um, will speak to us and that we have an open heart. Lord, thank you for each individual and each church that's here. And we just thank you for letting us have this time together. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand. I want to remind you as we worship this morning, it's just you and Jesus. Spend these next few moments engaging in worship. Guys, I encourage you, just a song that comes out of your mouth, let it be from your heart. Something you mean, something that's intentional. Right where you're at, can I just ask you, would you bow your heads for a moment, close your eyes. I know we had prayer, but I want you just to spend a moment. And Ms. Ashley asked God to just join us in this place. And so I, I want you to just take a moment right where you're at. And I want you to just ask the Lord, God, would you speak to me? Father, in this place, we pray that you would change lives. Have your way. Allow us to experience you, the fullness of Jesus Christ. God, we love you, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Singing of all he's done for me 
I won't stop singing of all he's done for me. He heard my cry, set me on a rock, saved me from the hand of the enemy. I won't stop singing about my Savior. I won't stop singing of all he's done for me. I won't stop singing of all he's done for me. He heard my cry, set me on a rock, saved me from the end of the enemy. I won't stop singing about my Savior. Oh, my whole heart, oh, my soul, let everything within me praise the Lord. Through the shadow, through the storm. Search the world, but he couldn't feel me. Man's empty praise and treasures of faith are never enough. But then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing, nothing. To show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing nothing is better than you Go! 
from our own experience that you won't fail us. And we know that the most amazing thing is that we don't have to beg you to be here with us. We don't have to sacrifice for you to be here with us. We don't have to plead for you to be here with us. God, you are here with us. Spirit, you are here moving among us right now. And we know that when you are with us and when you are among us, there is only one option that we have, that if we are your children, God, our only option is to fall down and worship you. Our only option is to to let go of the things in life that we are trying to hold on to tighter than we hold on to you. But God, I also know that there are people here who are, are not believers and who have not given their lives to you. And they may be asking themselves the question, like, can this be real? Can it be real that there is a, a God who turns mourning to dancing and beauty into ashes? Is there a God who would really be with us and a God who loves us that much? And God, today, I pray that you would show them just how real you are. I pray that you would show them that if they will give their lives to you, that you offer eternal peace and joy and love. But God, even more than that now, you offer to be with us and you offer to guide us. And so God, I pray that if there's anyone here who's trying to hold out, if there's anyone here who is trying to say that there are other things that are better than you, other things they would rather hold on to, God, I pray that today would be the day of salvation and that they would understand that you are the only thing that matters and you are the greatest thing in the universe. God, help us even now. I know that we're tired and I know that we're sleepy. I know there are so many other things that could be on our minds right now, but God, we're about to open your word. And I pray that you would please help us to be able to focus and to listen and to pay attention and to see what you have to teach us even now. Please speak through Ryan John. I pray that you please help him uh, with the words that he's supposed to say to us. And again, please help us to listen. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Thank you, Justin. Guys, uh, this morning as we begin, I want to say welcome. Uh, I know you guys are tired, some late nights, and I don't know if you felt like I did when you woke up this morning, a uh, little bit groggy, dragging just a little bit, and so uh, so how many of you guys feel like you're 100% awake right now? 
Yeah, okay. We got like two people in this entire room. How many of you go, hey, I'm struggling a little bit this morning. Feel a little tired, feel a little groggy. That's okay. Hey, here's the deal. We're going to move fast this morning, um, not for the sake of moving fast to just get through something, but I want to keep things moving because I know that, man, we're tired. Um, and the truth is that I got probably a lot more sleep than you guys did. Did anybody get to bed before 1130? This is 1130. I was out. I beat all of you. I feel really good about that. Listen, by the time we wrap up this session, you're going to start waking up. You're going to feel a little bit better, and all is going to be well. But until then, let me tell you, we are talking about unity among the church. Everybody say unity. Specifically this morning, we're going to touch on family. Everybody say family. All right, we are part of the family of God. Now, there were several individuals last night who made decisions for Christ, said, I want to surrender my life, that he would be Lord of my life. And I want to tell you, best decision you'll ever make. Um, Others of you, I know that there's some that stood up that just needed a little bit of clarity on where you were spiritually. And that is why, guys, when we do something like this, we send you back with your leaders so they can just talk to you for a moment, have a conversation with you, make sure that you know and understand what you're doing. Um, Man... Let me tell you, there is so much division in the church today. It's funny. Is Jared in here? Jared, you in here? Okay. Man, I was thinking the other day. So so I'm on the phone with Tim as we're beginning to schedule um, D-Now. And he said, Ryan, can you come down? Can you be a part of D-Now? I said, man, I would... I would be honored. I would love to. Um, and then he mentions this name, Jared, to me. So, Jared, when he mentioned your name, these, like, memories of seminary start flooding back of sitting in a classroom of all these dudes who aspire to be great ministers of the gospel. Uh, Jared has arrived. He is a great minister of the gospel. I'm still trying to work my way there. But I remember a story in seminary, not from one of our professors, but from one of our classmates, and he was talking about the vision among the church and how we oftentimes fight. How many of you guys, anytime a decision is made within your church, you form a committee? You've noticed that like there's this team of people that form and do a committee. Anybody have a church like that? Nobody in this room has a church where you go, hey, we need to form a team to make decisions. Let me tell you, I've been a part of a lot of churches that form committees to make decisions. If you're going to hire someone, you form a committee. If you're going to have, if you're going to change the menu for Wednesday night suppers, you're going to form a committee. Every little thing within the church, we have to get many people together to make a decision far more complicated than it actually needs to be. And we have perfected this process of complication within the church. And I remember sitting in seminary, one of our classmates talked about how he had witnessed his church get in a fight. A committee had been formed, and they were talking about the church facilities, and they were trying to decide what toilet paper they were going to purchase. I don't even know if you were in there for that or if you remember this, but what kind of toilet paper they were going to have. And he said, guys, we weren't like, and he's telling these seminary guys, we're all on church staff somewhere, and he goes, man, we weren't even fighting about one or two ply. We were fighting about the yellow stuff versus the white stuff. Y'all ever use the yellow stuff? I would compare it to sandpaper, okay? That's what I would compare it to. You're like, man, this is part of the message this morning? Yeah, literally. But let me tell you, there's a fight that breaks out, this shouting match that breaks out in the middle of this committee meeting or whatever that they're having to make decisions on what type of toilet paper. I mean, we fight about some of the smallest things within the church today. I can tell you right now, I can't speak for all the churches in there, but man, I can tell you this church, Sulphur Springs, has to be united. I know that because I've used the bathroom here, and I'm telling you it's the softest toilet paper at a church I've ever experienced in my life. So kudos to Sulphur Springs. I mean, y'all got like My hind parts were introduced to like a cloud. It was amazing. It was amazing. So kudos to you guys for that. Y'all got like quilted northern up in here. It's absolutely amazing. Um, I almost said the brawny man would be really proud, but he's like paper towels, isn't he? He's paper towels. Okay, so, but listen, we fight about the craziest things, and this weekend, what we're doing is we're trying to create more and more unity, coming together, being a part of the body of Christ, and making decisions and interacting with each other in a way that's healthy and builds up the name of Jesus Christ. Some of you are like, man, did he start out, like, did he just say his... Honey was introduced to a billowy cloud. Yes, I did. I did, actually. Um, This morning, as we go through this, I want you to take your Bibles, and I want you to turn to Galatians chapter 4. 
4 and 5, we're talking about being a part of the family of God, living in unity with one another. Take just a moment to turn there, and what we're experiencing here is firstly this. When we come to faith in Jesus, we're adopted by God into his family. We're adopted by God into his family. We're gonna talk about adoption into the family of God this morning. And Paul is writing this letter uh, to Galatia, okay? Today, this would be the area known as modern-day Turkey is where this would reside. Galatians 4, 4 and 5, I'm gonna ask you as you're turning there, let's stand in honor of God's word this morning as we read. Two verses, and it says this. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Adoption to sonship. Father, have your way this morning. Would you speak to us? Would you move in this place that we would hear from you? It's in the name of Jesus. And all God's children said, Amen. You may be seated. All right. This is the gospel story. This is the gospel in a nutshell. As he comes and he reads this to us and he's writing this letter, it says, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, who is Jesus, born of a woman, Mary, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Okay, adoption to sonship. Now, what it's doing is it is establishing for us a process by which we see adoption with the intent of sonship. What does that mean, sonship? This means that the intent of God by sending his son was this, that you might be adopted into the family of God and that you might become, when it says sonship, a full member of the family of God. Believe it or not, there are horror stories out there of people who adopt or take in children and they treat them as lesser than maybe their biological children. But what God is saying is when you make the decision that you want to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that you are fully adopted into the family of God. And there are no restrictions put on that. You are a part and you get to partake in all the joy, all the freedom, all the grace, all the mercy, all the accountability that is offered by our sovereign God, okay? And there's a lineage that takes place within the hierarchy of the family. We'll go back and we'll look at, we, we mentioned last night the prodigal son, right? This story, and he basically goes, remember, and he asks for his inheritance. Back in this day, biblical times, what would happen is the firstborn had Firstborn son specifically had rights that the rest of the family did not necessarily have. He had rights to the inheritance. This was family, uh, excuse me, this was money, this was property, this was all the things from the estate of the father. And this also came along with at the time when the father, father passes, um, all the fa father's estate passes through the son, but it also comes not only with possessions, but it also comes with a special blessing from the Father. Now, we're not really familiar with this today in our society to receive a special blessing from the Father, but it also comes with a spoken blessing from the Father of the household to the Son. And so, what we're seeing here is we're seeing that Paul says that you get to be fully adopted into the family of God, that you now have an inheritance of what the Father has to offer. And let's be clear. Here on earth, we, we look at that and we think that the most important thing to us is monetary, physical possessions. And that's, that's in our minds what's drilled in. Why? Because our culture is so fixated on material and physical things, whether it's appearance or possession. Those are the things that we fix our eyes and our hearts on that we want more than anything. The blessings of God are far greater than that. You will begin to understand that as you get older. And as you mature more, you begin to understand that, man, hey, listen, the more years that I'm alive, the more I realize that Christmas is not about me. And the joy of Christmas is not about me. Listen, I have two little children, and they are beautiful and wonderful and sweet, and I cannot imagine my life without them. But the joy on Sunday morning is not me waking up going, man, how many gifts do I have? 
under the tree. I mean, let me tell you, as an old dude, like, that's still fun. Like, I still like getting gifts. But in the morning when I wake up, man, I love to hear the, like, the thump, okay? My son, sound, I, his feet are super heavy. I don't know why. He sounds like a, like, baby elephant coming down the stairs. It's so loud. I'm like, son, how are you so loud? But on Christmas morning, man, I hear that thud, 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 thud. As he comes down the stairs, I get so excited because I'm going to get to watch that little man light up okay, and experience the joy of sitting by the tree and opening his gifts and how excited he gets over those things. Like, I, I begin, you begin to realize the older that you get that, that, man, the joy in life, the biggest blessings, okay, the biggest rewards are not the physical possessions or the physical gifts that you get and receive. They're being able to pour into and experience joy from others. That is such a blessing. So we've got family that passes down and is fully adopted, these children fully adopted, we into the family of God. I wanna read Romans chapter eight, 14 through 17, should be up on the screen. For those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. And the spirit you receive does not make you slaves. Catch that? The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, we are heirs, heirs of God, and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. And what does this mean to share in the things of Christ? We share in his sufferings, we share in his glory. And here's the thing, we no longer have to be fearful of the world, but we have access to the kingdom of God. And guys, many things within the life of being a believer, a Christ follower, flow counterproductive, counter to the culture that we experience today. Everything that the culture does tells you that your life is about you. Remember we mentioned last night that your life is not about you. Your life was intended by God. If you go read the beginning of Genesis when he created man, he created man in his image to look like him, to reflect him, okay? You are your purpose. You were created to reflect God and his glory in every single thing that you do. Adoption is a powerful thing. I remember in high school, I had this buddy who was adopted. Um, I'm just going to be full transparency. He was kind of a weird kid, okay? Kind of a strange dude. But let me tell you, his adoption story was so cool. His parents couldn't have their own child, and so they went and they uh, pursued and, and talked to basically a company that does adoptions and kind of helps orchestrate adoptions. And they were at first given a link to a website where they went on the website and they began to scroll through these children that were up or available for adoption. And you know what his family did? They landed on him. They saw a picture and they saw a brief description of who he was. And out of hundreds of children, they looked out and they said, we would love to meet him. And you know what they did next? They took a trip. <laughs> they took a trip and they sat down and this baby had been born, but this baby had, at the time, no name. Was not loved and man, what they saw and what they experienced was in this place, baby after baby sitting in cribs and no one was holding these children. Those children would be held to be fed and then they would be placed back down so that that person who was in that room could go pick up the next baby, feed that baby, put the baby down, move on to the next bed. But for my friend, everything changed one day when they walked in that room. And they walked this husband and wife over to one of the many cribs and they said, this is the baby that you guys had seen and we wanna introduce you. And you know what they did? They were able to take that baby. They were able to pick that baby up. They were able to 
hold and hug that child more than that child had probably ever been held and hugged in its entire life. They were able to feed that child a bottle. They were able to, at the end of the process, give that child something that he did not have up until that point. They gave that child a name. And his name is Chad. And he didn't have to be raised in a place where he wasn't held and he wasn't loved and he wasn't cared for. He was placed with a loving family who grew up with him and watched him grow up, raised him in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. He now serves on church staff in Montgomery, Alabama and has been doing that his entire adult life because someone made the decision, we want to adopt you. Years ago, I got a phone call from my brother. I have a two-year-old, a brother who's two years older than I am. How many of you guys have older siblings in here? I am the youngest. How many of you guys are the youngest? Okay. And so you know the family dynamics that go into it. I will tell you, my brother is amazing. Uh, He always included me with his group of friends. He was always bigger, stronger, faster than I was. Remember, I was the angry kid. I mentioned to you that I uh, I would go out and and even if I got the fire beaten out of me, I'd still go back for more, just kind of like stubborn and ignorant in that way too. Uh, One time, my dad, this is probably not kosher today, my dad goes, listen, I'm tired of hearing you two bicker and fight like I'm I'm over it, go in the backyard, take it out on each other, do whatever you gotta do. Y'all's parents, don't answer that. Never mind, I was about to ask you, I don't wanna, don't ask me. Okay, so we go in the backyard. I don't remember what happened. It was a concussive blur for me, okay? My brother, at one point, I remember the yard slanting up and somehow he got me down on the ground. He had both hands on my head And he was slamming it into the ground, and he said, do you give up yet? (laughs) I said, never. And I'm just getting my head throttled in. Okay, that was us as children. Um, That was the most brutal that my brother ever was to me. But even, I want to show you his kindness, even in that. When he grabbed my skull, he had one hand on either side of my skull. Okay, so like this is the meanest my brother ever was to me. Like you got the worst moment. That was it, right? but he had one hand on either side of my head. And so as he slammed my head into the ground, his hand was absorbing all the contact. Like he, he couldn't even, my, I remember my dad one time because I was just so ornery and stubborn. We had a pool and my, my dad grabbed me and he stood me at the edge of the pool. The pool's back behind me right here, okay? And he goes, uh, he goes Travis, you get a free shot. That's how ornery I was. Ryan, hands behind your back. I had to stand there like this. And my dad goes, hey, Travis, free shot. Hit him anywhere you want. My dad did that because he knew what was going to happen. My brother went, no, I'm good, and stepped back. Couldn't hit me, nothing like that. My dad later told me, he said, Ryan, I said, Dad, why why don't you ever give me that chance? He's annoying to me too. Like, why don't I get a chance to get a free lick? And he said, Ryan, I wouldn't give you a free chance because you'd take it. I want you to see the dynamic. My brother always included me, always took care of me, and I remember the day he got married, and a couple years later he called me and he said, hey, man, my wife and I have been trying to get pregnant and we would love to have a child, but it's just not happening. They went through a two-year process where they raised money, got out with a company to try to adopt a child, and everything fell through. Every test they did, every attempt at having a child had failed to that point. They wanted to uh, then go and adopt, and that fell through. Um, At one point, there was somebody who tried to uh, scam them and get all their money, Um, and it was just a miserable experience the entire process through. And I remember my brother calling me and going, hey, man, we've been fighting this battle for about five years of trying to either have a baby or adopt a baby. And it's just not happening. And, and he said, honestly, I've gone before the Lord and I've just said, hey, God, I'm, I'm, I'm done trying. I'm done trying. And about three months later, there was a lady from a former church that they had been at who called them and said, hey, are you guys still open and trying to adopt? And my brother said, yes. 
we're, we're not really trying right now, but if something came up, she goes, I have a daughter who is pregnant and wants to carry the baby full term, have the baby. We've had that conversation, but she knows that she is not in a position in her life to be able to take care of the baby. And when... And when she and I spoke about what would happen to the baby, she said, all I could think about was you and your wife. And we would love to talk to you about adopting this child. There were ups and downs through the process, but at the end of it, y'all, I have a nephew. And his name is Wyatt. And he had a mom who was wise enough to know, hey, I, I'm not in a position to be able to take care of this child, but I do know a couple that's looking and I wanna make sure that my child gets placed with a good family and is raised in a Christian household with people who are gonna love and cherish him and take care of him. Today, Wyatt is three years old. And he is loved he is fed, he is safe, and he is taken care of. And a great peace comes with that. And the truth is this, my dad called me one day, and I want you to get this picture of full sonship, okay? I want you to put it together. Not only does adoption take place, but full sonship, like every right that comes with it. Guess who will inherit everything my brother and his wife has one day? They'll give some to the church and some to ministries, but they'll give it to their heir, which is not a biological child. It's a child that was adopted, but who is a full member of their family and is loved like he is one of their own. My dad even called me, so this is Wyatt's grandfather, and he said, Ryan, I want you to know we're gonna redo, your mom and I are gonna redo our will and we're, because we wanna put Wyatt in the will. And I said, hey man, that sounds great. And he goes, hey, just for the sake of clarity, I'm just gonna tell you, we're gonna write him in as a full member of the family and he's gonna get the same benefits that your children are gonna get. And I looked at him and I said, I would have it no other way. Yes, he is adopted. He is not biologically their child, but he is fully adopted. He gets all the same privileges, all the same treatment, all the same love, all the same things that my kids get who are biological children. And I want you to know that when you are adopted into the family of God, it doesn't come with a bunch of stipulations, it simply comes with love. It comes with everything that God has to offer. First Timothy 5.1 says, do not rebuke an old man or excuse me, do not rebuke an old man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat young men as brothers. Now, remember, this is a letter, and he's writing Paul at this time to Timothy, 1 Timothy. So he's writing to Timothy. Timothy, at this point, is leading a church. He is essentially their pastor. And so Paul spends a great amount of time writing to Timothy, helping encourage him, lead him, and invest in him, and he's giving him instructions when he says, do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat young, younger men as brothers. Remember this whole idea of family. We are fully adopted into the family of God, and as such, now we have brothers and sisters in Christ, okay? Wyatt is now fully a cousin to my children, and he annoys them, and they annoy him, and they bicker, and they have at each other, and they do all the things that cousins do to each other, and it is, in my opinion, a beautiful, beautiful thing because he is a part of the family, and Paul is writing, and he says to Timothy, Timothy, when you're dealing with these people, and his instruction really can be summed up with this, deal with one another out of a gentle love. Can I be honest with you? As an angry guy growing up, man, I did not necessarily deal with people and interact with people with gentle love. That is something that God has had to teach me over time and soften my heart and mold me and make me into something different than what my fleshly self was, right? And so some of you struggle with that. 
that there is a gentle love that has to take place. And so we find also that in Matthew 12, 49 and 50, Jesus is talking and he says, and stretching out his hands toward his disciples, he said, Jesus, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. In a sense, when we belong to the family of God, we become brothers and sisters with one another. And again, we find this as the inclusive nature of the gospel, that God wants to include you in his family. So for those of you who sit there tonight and you feel isolated and you feel like an outsider, there is a God who says, hey, you know what? You may not be good enough for the world, but I want you. The world may tell you that you're ugly, smelly, nasty, untalented, that you'll never be good enough, that you'll never amount to anything, you'll never be smart enough. You'll never have a good job. You'll never be happy. You'll never be full of joy. The world will tell you all these things. But God says, you know what? I'm bigger, I'm stronger, I'm better, and I'm more capable than that. I can give you all the things that you ever needed and you never knew that you needed. If you'll just join the family of God. And then the last thing this morning, being together as a family means showing love as a family would show love. 1 John 3, 16 through 18, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech but with actions and in truth. We see here in these verses that Jesus gave his all for us, everything that he had. He never was running after material things, possession, money, wealth. He simply wanted to minister and meet the needs of the people around him. And I think, guys, that we need to put more of a premium on chemistry and love within the body of Christ. Um, I have for the last 10 years been on staff at a church in Opelika, Alabama, which is right next to Auburn, Alabama. I hope that we can still be friends. Don't judge, okay? I am a worship leader at that church, okay? So uh, Carson is in Trustville Electric Guitar, but the other two guys, we play together on Sunday mornings. We'll be back at our church on Sunday morning. I lead worship, and that's what I do at our church, and I love my job. It is a laughable joke to me that I make a living getting to do worship music and minister to our congregation because I love my job, and it is ridiculous that I get to get up every day and go to work. I am living the definition of do something that you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Like my job doesn't feel like work. I really just enjoy it and I've been called by God to do it. But I can tell you one thing that I am adamant about and if you talk to the team of guys, they will tell you I place a premium on team chemistry. Team chemistry, how many of you in one form or another are part of a team? Okay, this can be sports, this could be clubs at school, this could be, you know, uh, I don't know, chess club, whatever, I don't know what you're into, but part of a team, man, I think there is something special that happens when there is chemistry amongst the team. And when that chemistry takes place, there is this smoothness and fluidity to what happens, whether it's on a field or on a court or whatever, that is a beautiful thing. Guys, it is really hard to get up here and sing about Jesus with the team if we're fighting with one another. It's hard to get out there and say, hey, God loves you and he wants a relationship with you when there's strife and there's turmoil taking place amongst the team. When I took the job at First Baptist Opelika, I'm, you know, gosh, 10 years ago. So, I mean, I'm, I'm 10 years younger than I am now, and we've got all ages, okay, like college through uh, grown men, adults on this team. And so I'm brought in, and I'm supposed to be leading them. And I can tell you there were two personalities when I took that job. I went, they probably won't last because, I'm going to be honest, they were cranky old men. 
and they were not happy with anything. And when you're not happy with anything, you won't last long around me. Like I just, if you're, if you're a complainer and it's about you and you're just gonna tell me all the things you like and don't like, can I tell you, worship, this is not about me. Can I tell, can I, I'm gonna pull back the curtain for a second. Shocker here, I don't like every song that I sing. But guess what, worship is not about me. It's not about my preferences. It's not about my likes and dislikes. You may sit here this morning and go, hey, I don't really like that song you sang. You know what? It's quite possible me either. You know what? Sunday mornings, I got adults that come up to me and they go, you know what? That line in that song, I really don't like that. I had that two weeks ago. A lady came up to me, pulled me aside. She was like, I don't like that line in that song. <laughs> Sorry. Have a good day. You know, I mean, like, there's just not much I'm going to say there. Like, we don't have to like everything, but it's about the body of Christ and connecting with as many people as possible. And so not everything goes my way. I have a team that we are developing chemistry, again, amongst the team, okay? And so we make decisions alongside our senior pastor of what songs we're going to sing to catch the most people. And I meet two of these guys, and I will tell you, I had gentle conversations at first. Didn't we talk about that just a minute ago? That the way in which we enact, like, work with each other is out of gentle love, right? That's how we're supposed to interact with one another. And so I had gentle conversations with them, and I said, hey, you seem upset, you seem angry, you seem very opinionated. Uh, man, they were coming in and these two guys would bicker at each other in the middle of, um, I have kids, I use the word bicker a lot, sorry y'all. Um, and, and they would bicker with each other a lot and they would just argue and it made rehearsals really um, just awkward and not very fun. You ever been to a practice or a rehearsal or something like that and like there's fighting going on and it's super awkward? Man, we were beginning to have that every week and these two guys thought it was funny but what I noticed is the rest of the team would walk in at the last possible second plug in their instrument, grab their microphone, whatever it is, they would make it through rehearsal. And as soon as rehearsal was done, they were walking out of the room. And so what was happening was, and I began to have some gentle conversations with the other people on the team, and man, these two guys were making rehearsals really awkward for everybody. Man, rehearsal is something that, man, I, I enjoy. And so I had gentle conversation after gentle conversation. And I remember one of the guys, as I would have gentle conversations, he would ask me questions in return. And all of a sudden, I saw his heart begin to turn. And he started behaving more and more like a team member. And to this day, he is still a dear friend of mine. And he uh, is not at a point where he can play every week, but on occasion when we need someone, I still call him to fill in. Why? Because he heard, he listened, we had gentle conversations, and he went, you know what? Man, I'm, I'm willing to, to change a little bit. I didn't realize I was having that effect on the team. But let me tell you, the other gentleman did not. And I had gentle conversations with me and with him, and man, he would look at me and he'd say, oh, Ryan, I don't wanna be that person. But when we got to rehearsal, he, he almost became more ornery. He almost became more angry. And I will never forget, guys, Christmas Eve at church, especially our church, is a sacred thing. You walk in on Christmas Eve, we do like a candlelight service, we're talking about baby Jesus, and when you talk about baby Jesus, it's just a sacred thing, right? And I remember in the middle of sound check one night, he made several comments, not to me, to other team members that were super ugly, and on Christmas Eve, I looked at him, I turned around, we finished a song, and I turned around, and I said, Greg, I've had enough. You will not continue to behave like this. I said, I know it's Christmas Eve, but you will not leave until you and I have a conversation tonight. And I took him in the back, and I said, dude, your behavior towards your team members is inappropriate, it's uncalled for, and there's no reason you should be treating a brother or sister that way. And that was the last day he ever played with us. Fast forward six years from that night. He called me up and he said, Ryan, I'd like to talk with you. So I said, hey man, I'll, I'll come see you this afternoon. Worked at a local business, I drove over there. And man, six years later, after that really awkward night that he and I had, he sat me down and he goes, hey man, I was at a really low point and I was basically acting out. And he said, I didn't wanna hear what you told me that night, but I needed to hear it 
and I wanted to say thank you, and I wanted to apologize to you for my behavior back then and what I was doing. And our relationship on that day was restored. Guys, I want you to take a look around you. You are sitting in the midst, and I, and I get that not everybody in here is a believer, okay? Not everybody in here has surrendered their life to Jesus Christ, but let's hope that maybe there's a lot of people in here that are. These are your brothers and sisters. And in the church today, big church, we are really good at fighting with one another mostly within the body and the walls of the church. Can I tell you, the people who have hurt me the most in my life are not non-believers. The people who have hurt me most in my life claim to love Jesus. But the way in which interaction took place was not out of love. It was not in a gentle spirit. It was abrasive. It was harsh. And you know what? There are probably times at which I've done that towards someone. Guys, the chemistry that you have within the church today is a valuable thing. We are all working together towards the same goal, to honor Jesus, to know him, and to make him known. Can I encourage you that if you are at odds with a brother or sister in this place, or maybe they're not even here, but you sit there and there's that name in your head when we talk about the family of God and you just fight and you're at odds with each other. Listen, you don't have to be best friends with everybody, but Jesus says this, God says this, blessed are the peacemakers. And maybe this weekend, one of the biggest things that you could walk out of here doing is going, you know what, I'm gonna reach out and even though it's not gonna be easy, I'm gonna make peace with that person. I'll close with this. I had a church that, um, if you spend enough time on church staff, and the ministers in here will know this, you're, you're gonna get hurt at a church, okay? And oftentimes you'll get hurt by a church. I was a young guy right out of college, landed what would be considered probably a dream job in the church world, um, and I loved it, and it was wonderful. And I just, um, to simplify, I got burnt by the church, and it hurt me, and it took me years before I could get back on church staff. I traveled, and um, I did events like this, but I couldn't find myself um, in a place where I could get back on church staff. To supplement the income, because as a minister, you're never going to make much money anyways, and so I wasn't even on staff at a church. I was traveling doing this stuff. Y'all, I was broke, um, wasn't making much money, but it allowed me to do ministry, which I was, I was called to do that, and so I had to figure out a way to supplement my income, and so I started, I had a buddy um, who was a landscaper for a big company. He wanted to kind of step out. He was traveling with me as well, playing guitar. And so we started our own landscaping company and things grew and they were great. And I remember sitting on a lawnmower and I asked God, I said, God, will you just help me to be content mowing lawns? Guys, there's nothing wrong with mowing lawns, but when you're called by God to be a minister of the gospel, here's what they tell you. If you're called to be a minister of the gospel, you'll be miserable doing anything else. So with that in mind, I sat on a lawnmower and I prayed a prayer. I said, dear Jesus, would you help me to be content and happy cutting lawns? I'll work at Home Depot, I'll work at Walmart, I'll be a greeter there, I don't care. Just help me to be happy doing something else to where I don't have to be back on church staff. And you know, you see it coming, like I'm telling you a story. You know what happened? I became more and more miserable. More and more miserable. I sat on that lawnmower one day and there was a individual at the church who I got burnt by and they were like, they could have done something about it, they didn't do anything about it and in my heart there was bitterness. Just being honest with y'all, I was bitter towards this person, couldn't stand the thought, didn't wanna see them. It was like one of those things where like, if I see them out in public, it ain't gonna be pretty. You know, you like have these conversations with yourself about what you're gonna do and how you're gonna get them back and you start plotting and you start thinking and all that kind of stuff. Um, I sat on the lawnmower one day, it was that person. That's the viewpoint, the relationship where I was and, and I was dealing with all the anger issues, <laughs> you know, were like welling up inside of me at this point. And I heard God, not the literal voice of God, but I felt something in my spirit, the spirit of God go, Ryan, I want you to prepare to make a phone call to, I'll just call him uh, Jeff. Ryan, I want you to prepare your heart to make a phone call to Jeff. And I went, nope. Nope, 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 God, nope, not gonna happen, nope. 
kept saying that on the lawnmower. Not going to happen. I'm cutting grass about two weeks later, and I, and, and I spent a lot of time listening to, to music on a lawnmower because we would cut big fields. And so I put my headphones in, and I'm listening to some music and some worship music, and man, I'm praying and I'm talking to God, and, um, and man, again, I hear this voice, the Spirit of God coming and sitting in my soul, and I knew who it was. I knew who it was. I knew that it was the voice of God, and he said, oh, Ryan, you're going to have to call Jeff. I'm like, you need to prepare your heart for that phone call that's coming, and I went, nope, nope, second time, third time it happened, fourth time it happened, I went, you know what, okay, God. If I'm supposed to do that, you let me know. The funniest thing, I ended up going to church one week. He had left the church that he was at. I heard a voice behind me go, Ryan. And I knew it was behind me and I knew who it was. <sighs> yep. And I turned around and I said, hey, the chances of us ending up there together, I have no idea what those are statistically, but I knew at that moment, this is what God was preparing me for. And I looked at him and I didn't want to do it. I did not want to do it, but I knew that God wanted me to do it. And I knew I was supposed to do it. And I looked at him and I said, hey man, I would love to do lunch with you sometime. Would that be okay? And he goes, Ryan, I would love that. Two days later, I made the phone call that God had been telling me to make. I think he knew that I needed a little bit of an impromptu icebreaker just running into him randomly to kind of get me going. But I made the phone call and I said, hey, can we do lunch? We scheduled lunch. We sat down. We had a conversation. Apologies were made. We brought, it brought clarity and light to the situation. Um, but we walked out of there and we walked out of there in peace. For some of you sitting in this room right now, there's something going on in a relationship that you have with a person that is not at peace. Being part of the family of God means that sometimes we're gonna have to do things that we don't wanna do. Sometimes we're gonna have to humble ourselves in ways that we don't wanna humble ourselves. We're gonna have to reach out to people can I tell you, I felt like he needed to be calling me is what I felt like, the selfish part of me. That's the way I felt, but that's not what God said was gonna happen. Is there someone that you need to make peace with, whether here or outside of here? I would encourage you, don't waste time. Humble yourself before the Lord. Make every effort at peace and I am telling you, the blessings of God will flow more freely in your life because you humbled yourself before him. I must decrease, he must increase. And when that happens, we experience gentle love towards brothers and sisters. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning, the opportunity to gather in this place. Uh, for those who need to make peace with an individual or individuals, perhaps, there's more than one. God, I pray that you would give them the strength and the humility to do that, the boldness to reach out, to make peace. Father, thank you for this weekend. Thank you for the opportunity to focus on being united as the church and as a part of the family of God. It's in your name. Amen. All right. Thank you, Brother Ryan. Hey, we are going to uh, go into small groups now. And small groups for this morning are going to be a little different than they have been. We're not going back to our host homes to do small group. The exception uh, journey, uh, since we're going down to Camp Tuscoba, they are going back to Camp Tuscoba to do their small group. For the Word and New Hope and for Sulphur, we're all going to do our small groups here. Now, for the Word... There are some rooms labeled on this side of the hall. They're labeled by your, your age and your small group leader. And so that's where the word is going to be doing small groups over here in these four Sunday school rooms on this side. For New Hope, it's going to be these first three Sunday school rooms on this side, and they are labeled as well. For Sulphur Springs, you guys got a text about where we're doing those 
Girls are going to be in our back rooms here. Guys are going to be up at the hill at the old church. So if you've got any questions about that, have any issues, um, just, just grab me and we'll make that work. After we do that, we're going to go down. The Word is cooking for us today. They are going to have a great lunch prepared for us down at Camp Tuscoba. We're going to spend the afternoon having some fun together and come back together tonight. So love you guys. Y'all are dismissed to small group. <laughs>